Business Council um, and the Chair of the Academic Board at University of New South Wales. He's the past president of the Association of Applied Geochemists and his first experience of biogeochemistry was in Canada when his MSc supervisor exchanged his geological hammer for a chainsaw and pointed at him at some black spruce growing over the Hemlo gold deposit. He has published some of the first pace papers in the use of portable XRF in biogeochemistry, in mineral exploration and in environmental assessment. And tonight he is going to talk to us about extracting information from plants for mineral exploration and finding vertebrate fossils using portable XRF. Thank you very much, David. Okay, Wendy, thanks for the introduction. So I will share my screen. Is that working? Yes. Very good. Okay, well, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, speak tonight about uh, some biogeochemistry. Um, I would have been giving this talk in person back in April, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the virus took over. But this is uh, almost as good. So what I'd like to look at tonight is um, further evaluation of vegetation as a geochemical mapping medium but also testing out the capabilities of field portable XRF as an anal analytical device and possibly the principal analytical device. And I'll look at data from five projects where we're doing geochemical mapping for just general uh, geochem, and in some cases looking at mineral exploration and or environmental geochem. And I'll finish off with a slightly left field project which we uh, did a couple of years back using field portable XRF to explore for vertebrate fossils. And in doing so, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a large number of co-workers. I think Joe Schifano has uh, joined the meeting. Um, Joe's doing a very large project out in the Cobar Basin funded by the Minix CRC. Uh, but he and myself are being supported by a number of other organizations, companies and uh, government uh, surveys and they're listed here. So the picture there is of Madeleine Richerval, who was the first person that I ever saw point a field portable XRF at a tree. So Madeleine did her honours with me, but she was also working with Olympus Innovex at the time. This is not the first series of studies in the use of biogeochemistry for mineral exploration or even regional mapping. Work's been done in Russia, it's been done in Canada. We included some biogeochemistry when we did the stream sediment geochemical survey of the Northern Rivers area of New South Wales. We collected 250 micron stream seds, but we also got the field crews to collect whatever tree was nearby the um, stream sediment. So mixed genera, we grouped them into families and treated the data separately. In the case of arsenic, fairly close agreement between the stream sediments and the plants. I'd argue that we were getting a slightly uh, more subtle response in the vegetation to changes in geology than the stream sediments were delivering for us. But certainly areas with high arsenic values in the stream sediments or the veg were typically in areas with a number of sulfide mineral deposits. If we look at chrome, however, the response in the stream sediments is more distinct around the ultramafic units or the tertiary basalts in the region. Not a strong response in the vegetation, but it's probably due to the uh, general low mobility of chrome or the plants just resisting taking up that element. But in more recent times, we have returned to our biogeochem, but asking the question, can you use field portable XRF as the analytical device to get uh, your geochemical data? In, or better still, in the field? So of course, one of the questions that's immediately raised is, well, how accurate is field portable XRF? So here I plot for a number of elements, field portable, versus ICP mass spec 
on subsamples that we analyzed in the laboratory. For most elements, there is a very good correlation between the two methods, but in some cases with a calibration difference. But providing we've got a fairly strong linear response, we can adjust the field portable to the ICP values under the assumption that ICP is probably more accurate. It certainly uh, has lower detection limits for many elements. There are some elements that we're still trying to sort out. Sulfur is one. The thorium response in this data set was fairly poor, but otherwise, it's a fairly strong correlation. Hence, uh, we believe for many elements, field portable gives you data that's fit for purpose. I'm still trying to come to grips with the concept of concentration when you read the screen on your field portable. What do they mean by concentration? Is it a mass for mass? I think it is more the case that this is in effect a response that depends upon the number of elements, uh, or at least the, the number of atoms of element X sitting within the primary irradiation and the secondary X-ray return path that can be picked up by the XRF. I know there were adjustments made for the total radiation coming back which the field portables use to give an assessment of what proportion of that is the, from the element of interest. But we've done some studies in which we have taken vegetation, we've dried it out, and you do get a bit of a change in the response, but not a major change. Hence, it's not really a simple issue of concentration. In the case of water, I don't think it's as much a dilutant as an attenuator of the X-rays. There are a couple of other technical issues. The main one being how far into vegetation material are you detecting elements or are you getting a response from elements? So one of the tests that we ran was to get cellulose filter paper, which is not dissimilar to lignin or uh, cellulose in a plant. And we gradually piled up the number of filter papers between the field portable and various targets. These were mostly polished blocks with um, various minerals. What we see is a exponential decay path for every element, but the distance or the thickness of cellulose before the signal die out, uh, dies out is element dependent. And it's dependent upon the energy of the X-ray that we typically read, the secondary X-ray. For titanium, the signal had died out by the time you had about three millimeters. In the case of zirconium, you were out beyond 12 millimeters before you completely lost the signal. So the issue here is that you'll be picking up zirconium from much further into the plant material than titanium. If you've taken plant material and milled it up, it doesn't make much difference. But if you are zapping the plants directly in the field and you've got fairly thick organs that are inhomogeneous, that is, you've got a layering, you're gonna to have to consider um, where the signal is coming from and different elements could be reporting from different parts of the, uh, that organ. These are gonna some of the considerations that we're still um, working on. So let's get down to some case studies. And we'll start with Woodlawn, a copper lead zinc deposit where the mining ceased just over 20 years ago, but there are still very high metal contents in the old tailings ponds. So we've run some biogeochemistry looking primarily at the tailings ponds elsewhere on the Woodlawn mine site but also some samples moving away into what we would term background. We looked at two species, and this is the first biogeochem study that we did using um, vegetation, silver wattle and black wattle. In this case, the target organ was the bark. There was a mixture of these two species we had both black 
and silver wattle around the tailings. But when we got out to the background areas, it was dominated by the silver wattle. But there were a few clumps of black wattle that we were able to analyze. So this is analysis in the field. Walk up to the tree, point the gun and shoot. In the case of copper and lead, very strong response around the tailings ponds. Values in excess of 40 ppm copper or 50 ppm lead and fairly quiet background. The high values along the road here are due to drainage and uh, metals escaping from the tailings and moving towards the north. In the case of potassium, there is no substantial difference between the mine site or the tailings ponds and the background area. The slightly lower potassium values are due to the fact that up here you're on a ridge that has fairly skeletal regolith sitting over a granite. Of course, one of the issues for biogeochemistry is variation between species. We were up to establish that there was no major difference between the median values for the black and silver wattle for any of the elements. There tended to be a slightly bigger spread with the silver wattle, but I think that's because we collected more silver wattle from the vicinity of the tailings pond. But organ variation and species variation and sometimes subspecies variation is a problem in biogeochemistry. Well, it's a problem, it's an issue that you have to consider. But it's no different to being highly selective in the regolith materials if that's what you're sampling. Depending where you are on the regolith profile, of course, the geochemical response to underlying mineralization or the nature of the parent rock can also vary substantially. Another issue that people raise is the question of dust. When you're dealing with leaves or needles, especially if they've got nice waxy surfaces, I don't believe you get much of a dust problem. And you actually have to accumulate a fair bit of dust before it would have a geochemical influence on your analyses. Bark is a different matter. The acacia do have crenulated bark, which can collect dust. So we looked at the ratio of zirconium, zirconium iron, copper and zinc to titanium, under the assumption that the plants don't take up titanium. In the case of zirconium and iron, there was a very strong linear response in the, in the bark and in the surrounding soils. And in fact, they settle on the exact same trend. Our assumption here is that in the bark, we were dominantly looking at a dust signal. But if you look at copper or zinc, there is no correlation between either of these elements of titanium and no relationship between the plant and the soil. What we deduce from this is that the zinc and the copper are not due to dust on the bark, but they've actually entered the vascular system and then um, some of it's gone into the bark. Head out to Thakaringa, cobaltiferous pyrite deposit, which I think they're getting pretty close to mining. From the chip trays, we can see that weathering extends down to about 18 metres in this drill hole from the ridge here. And then between the 18th and 19th metres, you go from uh, saprolite into sulphide. In the surface, there's up to nine or 10 metres of highly ferruginized weather material. Over here, we see some electron micrographs in which we've mapped aluminium, iron, cobalt and sulphur. And it's pretty easy to see the boundary between the fresh sulphitic um, alibite quartz um, phyllite or schist that the uh, mineralization sits in and the surrounding weather material. In that, you lose the vast majority of your sulphur and your cobalt and the iron is redistributed. We can see that in both sets of micrographs. So while we were looking primarily at the soils, we did decide to collect 
some salt bush while we're out there. One of the interesting things about salt bush is there's very little point in ashing it because the ash content is up to 30%. So there's no great advantage to increasing concentration. So let's have a look at some of the results. The mineralization sits along this ridge or certainly the uh, weathered outcrop, fair bit of gossamer material. You do get a bit of jarosite along the ridge as well. A number of traverses over Pirate Hill and Big Hill. There's the mineralization on Big Hill. For the soil, it's not a very strong response. Slightly elevated over mineralization at Pyrite Hill, but really a fairly flat response. The vegetation, and this was by Phil Portable, it's a much more distinct response. High zinc right over the Gossen, and then elevated zinc down at the base of the ridge. There's also some elevated zinc over here, which are pretty close to the railway line. In the case of manganese, again, a fairly flat response, but if we look at the vegetation, a much stronger response for manganese, but primarily manganese increasing when you get towards the drainages. What was a bit concerning was the variation between two saltbush species, Versicaria and what we think is Pneumalaria. Uh, so I do have the advantage in my school, which is a combined biology and earth sciences, that uh, I can grab a botanist anytime I like and head out to the field. And botanists are very useful when you start doing orientation work with biogeochem. They can uh, really open your eyes to variations in vegetation, uh, changes in the morphology of plants and other potential um, geobotanical responses to mineralization, not just biogeochemical. Cobalt is only the ICPMS data because uh, the devices we were using, you can't uh, use them for cobalt because there's uh, a massive overlap with uh, the iron peak. But again, the, uh, the vegetation is giving a much stronger response to mineralization than the soils were giving. So a number of quite high cobalt values sitting over the top of the Gossen and in the flanks and a fairly quiet background. It's a sunny corner. And this is really the use of biogeochemistry as an environmental mapping tool. Sunny corner is a substantial silver lead zinc deposit just to the west of Sydney. The mining commenced in about the 1880s. And I think it was all over by about the 1920s. It's a site with substantial contamination, tailings and other rubbish, but also some fantastic mining archeology. span So we did some regional work, looking at the response of, in this case, radiata pine, to changes between metasediments and the mixture of felsic volcanics and metaseds, then some more detail analysis around the sunny corner deposit or mine site itself. Looking at the mine related contamination zones, but also along the main mineralized structure. In the case of lead, fairly quiet background, much more elevated values over sunny corner itself, especially in the upper parts of the areas where you've got tailings and other mine wastes a weakish response along the main mineralized structure. For arsenic, it's an even stronger response, an even quieter background, and an even stronger uh, set of um, anomalous or even stronger uh, geochemical contrast when you get into the mine-related contamination and along the mineralized structure. Now, in this case, we did most of the analysis back in the lab, got the samples, milled them up in a coffee grinder, and then zapped them in thin plastic bags. But we repeated a lot of the work out in the field by grabbing a handful of the needles and zapping them directly in the field. Um, not actually holding them, but getting a large clump, screwing it up, putting it on a thick plastic backboard, and then putting the field portable on it. Very, very similar results. For manganese, it is much more strongly affected by um, changes in lithology. 
So much higher manganese in the metasediments than in the felsic volcanics. So in that case, uh, the manganese is showing a strong response to lithology. And in fact, where you had the highest lead and zinc values, there was suppression of the manganese values. And I think um, those high levels of uh, heavy metals are restricting the uptake of manganese, which of course is a trace nutrient. But again, th these are questions that I have to put to the botanists because they're the ones that are up on these sorts of issues. Okay, we head to the cultural center of New South Wales, which is Hobar. And we turn our attention to cypress pine. The first time we played with cypress pine was back in the late 90s over the McKinnon's gold deposit. And there was no question the cypress pines gave the best response to mineralization. Not necessarily the greatest geochemical contrast, but the most coherent and widest zones of anomalies and a very quiet background. Well, in general, there was one gold spike over here. Now you're dealing with fairly thin transported or exposed in situ regolith cover. I always wanted to return to the Cobar Basin and do a lot more biogeochemical work. Hence, uh, when Joe Schifano came up, along, was able to get massive company support and get the Minix CRC to chime in and the uh, Geological Survey of New South Wales. Uh, Joe is now conducting a massive regional mapping program. I think he's devoted the last five or six years of his life to driving up and down the roads of the Cobar Basin collecting pine needles. So, Cobar Basin dominated by uh, plastic sediments in the northern part and with a mixture of plastics and volcanics and some intrusives in the south. It's a highly mineralized area with a number of uh, great mineral deposits with quite a range of commodities, copper, copper lead zinc, other polymetallic deposits, lead zinc silver, nickel cobalt and gold. So it's a fantastic place to be running regional biogeochemical mapping. This is quite preliminary data because uh, Joe has, has just received the main database, but this is the data for the field portable. All I say about the data at this point and uh, down the track, Joe will be doing a presentation for Smidge in Sydney and uh, hopefully you'll all be able to dial into it. But there are substantial variations in manganese and zinc as the geology changes. So you can see manganese tends to be much higher in the Girilam bone group than when you get to uh, units such as the granites in the south. And when you get near mineralization, the zinc values are starting to go up in the needles. Uh, Joe's done some work on a number, uh, very detailed work on a number of mineral deposits and I've never seen biogeochemical data like it in my life. There are some trees that have gold contents that if you ash them, should be included in the ore reserve calculation. Anyway, um, more data on that will follow. Again, um, the question of, of dust contamination has come up. We've run a series of studies. If we look at one of the deposits, we'll start with hafnium, europium and titanium versus iron very strong linear relationships. And this is analyzing the needles. I don't think there's any way of explaining this other than dust. For other elements, comparing gold versus arsenic and gold, lead, calcium and manganese versus iron, there is not a strong relationship between the two. Hence, I think we can say that even with some of the very high gold values in these needles, it is probably not dust related. But uh, Joe is undertaking some more detailed studies, looking at washed and unwashed needles, etc., to uh, answer that question once and for all. But what we're also considering is, again, how much dust do you need to get onto the needles so that there is sufficient mass ratio of dust to needle 
to, to change the geochemical response, assuming that trace element values tend to be higher in the dust. And I think you've actually got to have a lot of dust on your plants. You really need to be able to shake the plants and see the dust form a little cloud before it is a major issue. So I can't go past the talk without looking at Cyprus. Uh, just the geology there is absolutely fantastic. It's a really easy place to work. The food is, is great. And the geochemistry is even better. So just to reacquaint you with the geology of Cyprus, it is probably the world's best preserved ophiolite, the Trotus Mountains, with the ultramathic mantle sequence core to the mountain range and just south of the Arakapis transform zone, surrounded by mathic cumulates, surrounded by a fantastic sheeted dike complex where you can drive up to it, you can shut your eyes and you can feel the sheeted dikes and figure out from the slight change in grain size which way is up. And then if the surrounding seafloor kilo basalts, which host the classic cypress style copper deposits, dominated by copper, a little bit of zinc, tiny bit of gold, almost no lead, not much arsenic in them. Uh, there is also the chromite deposits in the ultramophics and what was Europe's largest asbestos mine. All the mines at this stage, I think, are in remediation. I don't think Scoriotis is, um, is currently being mined, but it's sort of off and on. The deposit I'll focus on is Kukino Pazula. And there's a shot of the uh, now abandoned pit with its beautiful pH three mine waters. And up the edge, the basalt that has been strongly affected by acid leakage from the oxidizing sulfides and subsequent weathering with a bit of a, um, a, a poorly indurated ferruginous cap over the top. And importantly, the area is chock-a-block full of Pinus nigra. Sorry, I should have mentioned, of course, up surrounding the Trotosophialite is a sequence of marine carbonates, starting with deep marine and going to shallow marine. So, you know, in excess of 90% calcite for most of these rocks. So beautiful geochemical contrast between the circumtrotos sediments and the trotos ophiolite, and then very nice contrast between the major units inside the Trotos Ophiolite itself. So uh, along with Neil Rutherford, we did the soil geochemical atlas of Cyprus, 5,516 sites with two samples of each. It's the highest density national geochemical atlas on the planet. And I'm just surprised they allowed us to do the sampling at this density. However, the trends are magnificent. In the case of copper, very high copper values following the basalts, as you might expect, but also a zone of quite high copper values in the sheeted dike complex, which of course is, um, contains the feeder zones that come up to the um, pillow basalts. So we have conducted both some regional and some follow-up work at a couple of the mines, collecting the needles of Pinus nigra. The first point I'll make is the, the strong correlation between the ICP mass spec and the field portable XRF data. This data is hot off the ICP. We only got the data about a week ago, or at least most of the data a week ago. We did the field portable uh, a few months back. So very good correlation. If we then look at the regional trends, quite a strong increase in copper when you get near the main copper deposits. When you're within about 2K, the copper starts to jump up. But the element that jumps out is rhenium. 
I think this is the first time in my life I've ever paid any attention to rhenium. It's just never figured in any of the geochemical studies I've been involved with. We ran some rhenium analyses eight years ago on some pines and got these really high values and I simply doubted the analysis. We've gone back and we've done the new sampling and analysis and when you get near the copper deposits, the rhenium values go up by two to three orders of magnitude. It is a much stronger response than you had in the soils. Although you do have elevated rhenium when you get to the copper deposits and the rhenium is unrelated to moly. But in the veg, it's a super strong response. The Kokino Pizzula pit, much more detailed sampling around the tailings and the edge of the pit itself, very strong rhenium response. Get away from it and it drops away to just about nothing. I would say this project was delayed a tiny bit um, while the police investigated the first case of mass murder in Cyprus. And um, unfortunately, they used the Kokino Pizzula pit to dump the bodies. At any rate, um, We'll come on to the elemental composition of bone in the last part of the, uh, the talk. This is one of the first occasions when we've had a moderately strong copper response in pines. The work that Joe's been doing and previous work that we've been involved with, copper is an element that the pines restrict the uptake. It is a micronutrient and they are very particular how much copper they've got. They go for the Goldilocks scenario. Not too little, not too much. I rarely have seen a good response to copper. Zinc, much stronger response. That being said, the pines invariably give you much better results than the eucalypts. And I think the problem is, and that's been in a number of projects, eucalypts are simply too smart a tree. Pines are an exceptionally stupid species. <laughs> they take up just about anything, which of course makes them ideal for biogeochemical sampling. Okay, I thought I'd finish up by looking at a different commodity. So we've looked uh, a little bit at uh, copper, a bit at lead, some zinc, some gold, some cobalt. Let's look at another commodity, which is vertebrate fossils. Now, I know the paleontologists will berate me for calling fossils a commodity, but that's what it is. Far northwestern Queensland is the home of the famous century lead zinc silver deposit, one of the largest lead zinc silver deposits in the world. I think it's mined out now. But the paleontologists will say, well, that's irrelevant. The important thing is adjacent to it is one of the most important fossil deposits on the planet. It even got um, uh, Attenborough to have his jaw drop at just the quantity and the range of fossils that have come out of this dig. It has rewritten the vertebrate um, biology, vertebrate paleontology of the tertiary in Australia. But just about all the fossils have come from a very small zone, the Riversley World Heritage Area. There is a massive tertiary limestone platform extending out to the west and to the south which is also potentially very fossiliferous. Now, you think, well, you know, there's only so many blocks of limestone you can be digesting with uh, vinegar. But the problem for the paleontologists is they're missing part of the record. So there are some fantastic creatures that have come out of there. Fangaroo. Thingodonta, and believe it or not, they've got away with Thingodonta 
as the official name for this fossil. It's been published. And the reason it's Thinodonta is it's got a tooth, but otherwise they have no idea what it is. A Caltadetta, one of the most vicious animals to ever grace the planet. Now, I will confess that we did add the blood for effect, but it is not the sort of animal that you would like to meet up on the camps at UNSW at night, especially since in the last week, we've had two students on campus bitten by foxes. One student thought it was a pussycat and went up and patted it and the fox bit him. Anyway, that's not to worry, they weren't science students, don't panic. Nimbodon, probably the most bizarre marsupial ever. It took a decade until they realized they had it up the wrong way. This is the original drop bear. The problem is there are two gaps in the sequence in the faunal zones. They need to find deposits to fill these gaps. And that's where we come in. Their exploration technique is to walk around, drive around or fly around and every now and then stop, hit a few limestones and see if a bone drops out. Um, that has been moderately successful over the last 40 years, but it is not what an exploration geo would call a systematic approach. So what are we after? We're after bone, which is hydroxycarbonate apatite or HCA. It's the bone, tooth enamel or dentine. It of course is a member of the apatite family, but with substitution of carbonate for some of the phosphate. For the calcium, you can have substitution of a range of elements, mostly divalent, such as strontium, magnesium, um, and you can even substitute in uh, the rare earths, uh, and of course europium will go in. You can substitute sulfate or the urinal iron in for the uh, phosphate group, and you can substitute chlorine and phosphorus for the OH. So what do you typically find in um, bone material. And uh, my former dean did give consent for me to uh, check out the composition of his skull. So not surprisingly, bone is mostly calcium and phosphate, but some fairly high concentrations of a range of other trace elements. And of course, some of these elements, bone is where the body can secrete toxic elements. Other places are in the hair or um, you know, the preference is to excrete toxic metals, but if it's going to retain them, those are the two primary organs. We analysed a whole lot of fossil samples from the Riversley suite, which is held at UNSW. Well, of course, it's, it's owned by the Queensland Museum and some of the host rocks for those fossils. Plotting calcium versus phosphorus, and I've plotted on the appetite, or in fact, this is the case, the hydroxy carbonate appetite control line. What we notice is in the case of lead, uranium, and strontium, in general, the more bone material you've got, the higher the concentration of those elements, especially in the bones of bats. Bats are a high level feeder. They eat meat and all sorts of other bits and pieces, and you get bioaccumulation. In the case of titanium, there was much higher concentrations in the surrounding host units generally than in the bones. Zinc was a bit all over the shop. So I thought, well, what are we after? What are the exploration indicators of vertebrate fossils? So there are two things. There's the indication of the effects of the fauna itself. So bone fragments, uh, guano, and other material, which could contain high calcium, high phosphorus, or even bone material. But also, these fossils have been deposited in caves. Now, a karstic terrain developed, which was then uh, infilled by all sorts of stuff, secondary carbonates, plastic materials, and on the odd occasion, an unlucky animal. The, pro the issue for the, for the paleontologists is 
What if you can't see a bone sticking out of the rock? If that's your only exploration mechanism, then that's not very effective. So on just one of the deposits, well, I should say one, we, we've looked at a number of the deposits, but in, this was the first one we tested out the use of the field portable. From the wall rocks into the cave deposit itself, all sorts of elements leapt up. The titanium zirconium ratio leapt up. The amount of phosphorus that could not be directly related to obvious bone material also leapt up. A number of very good geochemical indicators that you are in the right deposit, you're in the right rocks. And if you're lucky, you may also pick up the actual signal of the uh, fauna itself in the form of phosphorus and a couple of other elements. So the only reason we did this study was, I was actually working, uh, doing some work on Lady Annie and we had to go up for a few days to Riversley and I'm, I'm not gonna sit there swing a sledgehammer. I'm not a paleontologist, that's not my problem. So I'm just you know, moseying around and zapping the occasional rock with a field portable. And I went over this deposit and I thought, oh, hold on, that's interesting. But of course, the other model of the story is um, never go into Queensland without a gun. So just a couple more slides. The um, JDM site, here are the host units, the carbonate platform, and uh, it's probably a cave structure that has delivered some nice bone samples from this location here. We just analyzed phosphorus. There's not much of a difference between the, what's effectively the foot wall of a hanging wall and the main vertebrate fossil bearing horizon. But if you go to things like uranium, zinc, lead, in this case, multiplying together, there is quite strong geochemical contrast. So what I'm able to tell the paleontologist is, you know, what are the boundaries? Are you in the right rock unit that you can now go and start more detailed visual exploration to see if you can um, pick up some uh, fossils? Or as they do, go and dig a hole every now and then stick some uh, gelignite down there and blow it up. So I must admit, it is fun playing with a paleontologist. So as I said, vertebrate fossils, just another commodity to me. I wouldn't know one end of a, uh, uh, an Akata data from the other, but the field portable is delivering some workable results. Anyway, so some of the conclusions, field portable is delivering some very nice results for a range of important elements in the lab, but also increasingly uh, we're finding just in situ analysis is working. But there are a couple of things we need to sort out in terms of the way you collect and present the sample to a field portable when you're out in the field. You do have to watch the depth of X-ray penetration because it is element dependent, especially if you're analyzing uh, organs that are thick but not homogeneous, where there's layering as you go into the plant. At Woodlawn, Thackeringa, Sunny Corner, Cobar, and at Cypress, the vegetation is delivering some very strong spatial signals at the regional and at the deposit scale. And again, the field portable is delivering data that is fit for purpose in terms of exploration or just um, regional mapping. It'd be lovely if the field portable could get down to the detection limits required for rhenium, but it can't quite do that. Uh, well, certainly not the current generation of field portables. And uh, the uh, paleontologists want us back out into Riversley probably next year to start a more systematic regional mapping program to see if we can detect those two missing parts of the um, Riversley fauna succession to see if there are some interesting animals that are unknown. And that is it. That's an excellent talk, David. Thank you very much. So I need to stop sharing. And did we have any questions? 
I was uh, wondering, um, can you use the dry pine needles or do you use fresh pine needles? Uh, you can use either. There will be a bit of a difference because uh, with the fresh pine needles, which, and Joe might correct me, I'm sure they are at least 30% moisture. It may be higher. Um, that has an attenuating effect, which is element dependent. So uh, if, you're, if you're mixing fresh and dry, you'll probably have to apply some correction factors. But I think those are, those are fairly easy to develop. But you do, you do have to watch uh, uh, apples and oranges. Yes, of course. Well, that was very exciting um, application of XRF and thrilling. And uh, I will be shooting trees with my XRF and be sure to take a gun to Queensland. Does anyone else have any questions for David? You can enter it on the chat or um, I'll see if I can, oh no, perhaps David, are you able to um, yes, I, unmute I, people? Yep. Uh, so either unmute or uh, stick a question into uh, the uh, group chat. I think one of the issues for Western Australia is you're a bit light on with um, pine trees. Yeah. There's the she-oak. Do you know the um, usefulness of the she-oak? Uh, generally, I've found the response in she-oaks are better than the eucalypts. Uh, the, the eucalypts are just too controlling on their uptake. Um, right. Biro has done a fair bit of work, and uh, I think some of the companies, but. Uh, the results have been so-so. They just have that needle-like quality. Maybe they're also stupid trees. <laughs> it looks like everybody's very much enjoyed your talk, David. Um, yes, tri triodia. Um, look, I, I've got to get back to the data. We have been looking at uh, rare earths and spin effects in a xenotene deposit, and the spin effects is taking up xenotene or taking up the rare earths. You can boil xenotene in aqua regia and it has very little effect, yet the plants are attacking it. Hence, uh, we've got to be thinking in organic space. And of course, uh, some organic species have very strong complex capacity with elements and can break down minerals that otherwise by inorganic methods are quite difficult. So I'm, I, am a, I am a fan of spinifex. They're not the most pleasant plant to sample and process. Yes. Do you think that there might be some microbial um, activity, some yes. sort of, um, what would you call it, symbiosis with the plant yep. and the microbe, soil yeah. microbe? I think so. Uh, look, we're, I think we're, we're just starting to get the grips with the biological world and the influence it has on regolith evolution and the mobility of elements. Uh, as geochemists, we till, still tend to think a bit too much in inorganic space and go to our poor bay diagrams and say, oh, this element will be mobile here and not mobile. But yet given the complexity of biological systems and just the range of organic species, um, I think they can they can work miracles that in, you can't do in, in in inorganic space. Absolutely. Um, a question about rainforests. I have not done um, any work in rainforests, and I'm just trying to think whether some work has been done. I'd have to think a bit would have had to have been tested in either Africa or uh, Malaysia or, uh, or Brazil. Um, I am actually involved in the tropics, but we're using the field portable to help look at cave stratigraphy at the near caves uh, in the search for hominid fossils. So uh, we've got another fossil project going.
Well, we can take one or two last questions if anyone has one. We're very close to time there, David. So I just want to say thanks again uh, for <laughs> jumping in and uh, rescuing the evening's presentation with your own Zoom and uh, for entertaining us so well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for attending. Thanks all. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.